All right. Well, hello. Good morning, everyone. I see we've hit nine o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and get us started for today. Um, so my name is Amanda. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is common errors and uh, troubleshooting. And um, this is uh, going to, our examples today are all going to be in USAS. So we have this marked as a USAS training, but some of the things that we talk about when we're looking at errors um, we're going to venture into the app log, um, can be applicable uh, in USPS too. So um, while we're focusing on USAS, if you support both, uh, this could be helpful in multiple places. Um, so I'm started here on our home page. And uh, we usually start here. I wanted to point out before we get rolling that um, this may look a little bit different. Our spaces here have kind of been condensed. So now that we uh, don't have to worry about classic anymore, <laughs> we have um, a little bit smaller list here. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, we are going to hop into the wiki and um, talk about where you can find common errors there. Uh, before I get too far in, though, so um, I don't want to get ahead of myself because I wanted to make sure to say the other thing is that this training, um, as I was compiling this together, I'm re I was realizing, you know, this will be uh, a little bit different than our regular Fridays with Fiscal trainings, where we're going over and focusing on a specific part of the software. Um, you know, since we're looking at errors and how to troubleshoot them, uh, generally errors pop up when you're not expecting it. <laughs> so um, there's not just, you know, one specific like page we can look at and, you know, tell you all the things that happen on that page, like if we're focusing in on a part of the software. So we are going to be hopping around a little bit today. Um, but what I what my hope is, is that by kind of going through some of these examples and talking through them, I'm going to talk about kind of what I would do to look at these things. And I think maybe, I'm hoping kind of maybe the familiarity of talking about some of these things with looking at the errors that we don't always get to talk about um, can help you with troubleshooting these if a district reports them to you. Uh, that, with that said, um, throughout this training, uh, like I said, we'll be looking at different errors. I'll be kind of like explaining things. Please, please, um, this is definitely one um, I mean, we always say this, but especially today, if you have questions on any of this, if you have thoughts or things that you want to um, talk about or see more of, um, just let me know. I have the chat window open. Um, you're welcome to unmute and ask a question. So definitely let me know um, as we go. Okay. So uh, the first place I'm going here in the wiki is, um, again, I'm just going to focus on USAS today with our examples. I see my chair is causing a weird video thing. So, all right, so I'm in the USAS wiki and I'm gonna scroll down here to our appendix and scrolling again, the last thing here that we have on the list in the appendix is USAS error messages. So um, I wanna make sure to bring this up at the beginning. I don't know that I'll like refer back here throughout our session today. But this is a really good tool. Um, uh oh, hang on. I'm sorry, my Chrome went away. Hang on, just a second. Let me get it back up. Okay. Well, at least it's got a little shortcut where I can just reopen everything I had open before. That that's handy. Okay. All right. <laughs> so we're still back here on the same page. And um, what I want to point out is that at the top of this page, we do have a thing that says it's marked as a draft. So um, basically, we have it marked as a draft because this is something that we are continuously looking at, updating um, if we find new errors that are reported to us through the, the support desk. Um, we continue to add them on here. Um, sometimes there are errors that, you know, 
like these can change over time essentially uh, in a way like if there's something that may have been an issue we do our best to keep this updated is what i'm saying and and it's a tool for you where if you get a certain error you may be able to come look and search for this like you know say i have something on a purchase order i can come here and get uh what the error message is so you could search this page um or do like a control f to find on this page for a keyword in your error um, or just look through the section and then we have a little blurb that says you know this is when this happens um sometimes give some ideas for what you can look at um if, if you uh, have a district that's encountered that error so this is a good tool to um, use if uh you have you know an error that you're looking into and again that's something that we um you know will continue to update over time as well okay so we're going to be mostly in the software today. Um, again, I have some examples I've prepared to kind of look at. We're going to, it was very, very funny for this one. I'm like, you know, usually I'm going through our test instance and making sure everything works for what we want to see for what we're, you know, demoing, what we're looking at together that day. And, you know, and so this one's funny because I'm in here like trying to, make errors which is not not the typical so usually we're trying to avoid those when we're doing the training so um so that was definitely interesting um now the other thing that i um kind of have in my notes here before we jump in and start looking at one is uh and i kind of touched on this is you know um as we get to looking at these there are kind of a couple different kind of errors and the first kind that I think about is there are some errors like this first one we're going to look at um, where they're very intentional, like some information when they're inputting is incorrect or wrong. The error message pops up. It's very obvious, like it's very good in the error message, you know, what it is, um, what's going on. And those are ones, you know, we we can anticipate those situations like the the programmers, the developers can say, OK, well, I know these fields are required. So we have an error message ready to go and configured for when users run into that. We'll also look at the situation a little bit later on of error messages that, you know, maybe something like um, isn't working exactly how it should or um, you're getting it in a different spot. And so there are some messages where it's a little bit more complex, too, and um, I hope to kind of like talk about some strategies for troubleshooting those as well. Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, and that's the other thing. So as we're looking to, um, I'm going to talk about, obviously, I hope this can help you with troubleshooting and being able to, you know, find, like, you know, get some more information so that maybe um, you could skip, like, maybe you can directly, like, figure it out, help the district. Obviously, there are definitely situations where you'll need to escalate it to us still. And so we're going to talk about that along the way as well as, you know, what information do you want to gather? Um, if you've had tickets with us on an error, you may have been act, asked for a stack trace or um, like the error detail. And I'll tell you, the first time I was at, asked for a stack trace <laughs> back in my ITC days, I was like, I don't even know what that is. So, um, so we're going to talk about that. I'm going to show you. Uh, you know, what it is that you want to grab. So, okay. Okay, enough talking for me. Let's look at an error. So, um, for when they get an error, uh, actually, you know what? Let's look at one first. So, I'm in a demo instance. I'm in a, I'm in a support instance right now. So, I can come in here. I'm going to go ahead and add a record. So let's add so I'm adding a vendor so into core vendors and we'll let the vendor number default um so some of this information let's say it's a non-1099 vendor honestly I'm going to keep it very simple here uh we're going to go ahead and add a location and let's give it an address Oop, that's the name that's the name
All right, here's where we put in our address. And you know what? Let me do this. Let me, let me, let's expand this so you can just see it a little bit better here. There we go. And then, so what I'm going to do, let's put in our state. And sorry, I'm a little bit zoomed in. I know some of our columns are cut off, but I have it zoomed in, you know, for my screen so you can see it okay when you're looking at it through the Zoom. So sorry about that. And you know what? Let's say, all right, we got our vendor form and it's got the um, zip code, but we've also got like a couple extra digits on there. So uh, here, there we go. So I'm going to enter that in just as it's on my vendor form. And then let's go ahead and put in a phone number here. And we'll check all those boxes um, so that we have those all set for our vendor location. So we're good to go. We're going to save this up. Now, when I go to save, I pointed out that um, zip code because we entered it how it was in our vendor form, but the software is going to recognize, um, hey, this is an invalid postal code. So this is one of the areas that I'm talking about where it's pretty clear. It's something that's like an input. You know, the, the software knows like what format it expects it to input in. So if I go um, look here, let's let's do this as well. So postal code, just for good measure. Um, so I actually do have an error message related in my common errors. And um, when I look at this, it's showing me that it's either five characters or nine characters. So XXX or look, I didn't have, I was missing a digit. Um, so if I come back here, I can go ahead and know that it's this field that's my issue. And I could correct that. So this is one to get us warmed up, right? Like this is pretty simple. This actual message right here tells us exactly what we're looking for. And then it gives the value of that location so that we know, because vendors can have multiple locations so that we know which one we're looking at. Now, before we fix this, um, so the stack trace, is something you may be asked for. Um, like if you put in a ticket, we're looking for that more information. I usually try, we usually try and also say like error detail. And um, the first place to find that, there's a couple, but the first place to find that is when you're looking at an error message like this and, um, or the district's looking at an error message like this, there's these two little arrows that are all the way to the right here. If we click that to expand the error, it gives us the detail. So this is what we refer to as the stack trace or the error detail. So um, for a ticket, if you have one of these that you need, what you can do is just go copy all of this and then put it into a Word document. So like I have a notepad open here. So say I come into notepad and um, paste that in and I didn't copy it right. <laughs> oh boy. There we go and paste that in and then you can do file, save, save it as a TXT and then attach that to your ticket. So um, just right off the bat there, that's what and we are looking for sometimes when troubleshooting an error um, to get that additional detail. Now, the interesting thing is we'll look at these throughout the day. I'm not always going to copy them in a notepad because I know that's not very fun to look at. But um, what we can see here is we can see a little bit more information on this, even just by kind of looking it up. I know that this is very like techie looking right off the front. Um, but uh, with looking at these over time, um, I have ventured in here, here quite a bit. And, and the interesting thing is that if you kind of like look through, you can get some pieces of information. And so with this one, obviously we know from the main error message what we're what we're looking for. But if we didn't, you know, if we needed to maybe find out more and we'll see with some of these other examples, we have a little um, context section um, that is sometimes down here. And, you know, this is saying like the user that it happened with, um, component, mostly I look I'm like, okay, vendor. So something that has to do with the vendor page. 
And then here, we're going to talk about this word null throughout the day. Um, this is one to make a note of. Um, if you haven't, you might have heard this one. It comes up sometimes. Null means blank. Um, I When I think of null, it's it's something maybe blank or like not correct. So sometimes if data is incorrect, then it's not finding the value that it expects. So maybe it's not formatted correct, um, as in this case. But null usually tells me that I might want to look at the fields that are included in whatever thing is having the error. And so um, that's kind of a clue when I see it in these error messages. Uh, the other thing you can do, so if you open, if you are able to open and look at these error messages, if you scroll down um, about halfway, now, again, this is kind of interesting because I know it's not cut and dry. Like, I know this is not just like a, hey, it's, you know, you look at it. I mean, this one, luckily, our main error message does. But if you're looking at one of these um, that's not so apparent, uh, so if you scroll down about halfway, sometimes there's another error message down here. And I've found in my experience that if I come in here and look at the second error message, sometimes it gives me a little bit more. So like this one, I see it's got postal code in it. And sometimes I'm just looking for like a keyword in these error messages. Like I'm totally not expecting you to be able to, you know, read these. Obviously, there's a lot of stuff on here that doesn't make any sense to me either. Um, if we have to escalate it to the developers, they can read this. Um, but uh, but yeah, so so what I'm usually looking for is like a keyword that can kind of prompt me on maybe like what to look at, right? So so that that additional message about halfway down sometimes can be very handy. So that's a good thing to look for. Okay. <laughs> Had something else I was going to say there, and uh, let me just make sure I'm not getting ahead of myself. Okay, we'll we'll move. I'm sure I'm sure it'll come back. Um. Oh. So I think this is kind of part of it. Is uh, the other thing to keep in mind here. So now we've looked at this error message. We can see in this error message it tells us things about like the page and potential field. You know, what I'm saying. Like if we're seeing maybe this um, like null, that might mean missing information. So we're obviously looking at this as the situation just happened on our screen. That's not usually how it happens for you all. Like if you have a district that's reporting an error, sometimes you're just getting a little screenshot of, you know, just this red box, right? So one very important thing that I would do if there's being an error reported, is ask them the steps they were taking directly before um, getting that error. And um, this can be really, really helpful because sometimes, like, again, this one gives good context, but we'll see um, some other ones where, you know, maybe the context isn't fully there. And so if, like, in this case, my user says, hey, I'm getting this error, you know, what is going on here? Like, this says address, et cetera. If I open the error message, I can see it's related to the vendor. But if they could just tell you, I was putting in this vendor, I, here's their information that I entered, um, then what I would do is go look through this and you know maybe you can spot that information. I already fixed the zip code and we can save this up. But maybe you can even spot it. And you know sometimes it's not as obvious as this. <laughs> like obviously this is just our example. Um, but sometimes just looking, at you know whatever it was that they did the point in time where that happened so that error occurred when we tried to save the vendor that can be really helpful um one thing to do uh with this is um try and recreate the error so in something like this we're adding a vendor we'd be making a change you'd want to do that in a test instance and so um, if you're hosted on management council, I think you can pull a test instance right through VRA um, potentially. And then um, if you're self, a self-hosted um, ITC, your tech team may be able to help you out uh, with something like that. But that's one thing that is huge in helping me troubleshoot. And 
um, you may notice <laughs> when you um, put in tickets to us, you know, we uh, do look at the backups a lot because we can look at the exact information and the exact situation. And it's very, very helpful for troubleshooting to run through something in a test instance. So getting those steps that they were taking directly before and then, you know, um, being able to go like redo that, like go do those steps yourself. Sometimes it's as simple as that. Sometimes you can walk through those and be like, oh, you know, this field was blank or, you know, this box need to be checked or something like that. And, and that can help resolve these a lot quicker, you know, um, if you're just able to kind of walk through that. Now, if you have something that's not making a change, so if you are looking at something on a grid, uh, running a report, like anything where you're not actually changing the software, you could even do that right in their live software. And this next example we're going to look at um, falls under that category. So I'm going to go to the activity ledger. And you may have run into this one. I know that this one comes up. Um, comes up. This is one of the common errors on there. We have it in the general section. Um, we're going to talk about the excessive query. So let me go ahead. Let's go here. Let's go to the top of our page and let's go to general. So excessive query detected. Please add additional filters to the query. So um, this error happens when the grid is unable to handle filtering through a large amount of data. Now, um, again, this one, if this comes up, it's something that uh, you have a user that is getting an error for, you know, you're not making any changes. So you could log in with, you know, your admin or ITC account to their instance and come in to the grid. Um, now the columns that are on here are customized per user. Uh, so you might want to ask them if they have any, you know, special columns they've added or sorting on. This is where screenshots really help out. <laughs> um, but uh, basically, uh, when this happens, it the um, grid is basically having it. It's got so much data to sort through; it's excessive um, that it's basically um, giving an error and asking for an additional filter. Now, let me go ahead before because I have a couple things to talk through on here. I'm trying not to get ahead of myself. <laughs> is uh, let me go ahead. Let's do uh, a filter on this. And for example, what we're going to do, so I have my more option here. Let's open that up. I have, you know, my standard kind of um, transaction numbers. I have some additional things here. And then I have all of these categories I can open to add more things to my grid. Now, in this case, I've scrolled all the way to the bottom. I went to the account. I went to the account code and I added the fund. And this is something pretty common that they might want to do on this grid. So I've added the fund. And so let me drag my fund over because I don't, I think I left it at the end here. Let's drag this over so we don't have to keep scrolling. So in this case, what I'm going to do is sort of my fund. And boom, I get the excessive query cost and says, please add additional filters to your query. So one thing that I know is it's tough with this. It's tough to um, think about because um, if I X this out and then I say, okay, well, let me do, let me put my date in here. Oops, let's do 22. We get a little bit more in there. Um, so if I enter my date and I narrow it down, I don't get the excessive query cost. And um, it's interesting because um, it really has to do with kind of how these fields are linked to this grid, how information is gathered. And so if I were to do the date and then I were to do the fund, I were to do the fund, let me, let me retry that. There we go. Then, it can go narrow down my data set. Now, the simple explanation for why this is helping is obviously I have less entries for this fund to sort through because I'm only searching the entries for this year now. I know the difficult part with this is, you know, why some fields, why not others? Like that is the part that um, is, 
you know, a little bit more complex. And, you know, one of the ways that I think about it is, you know, when I'm looking at this more um, window, this can kind of help me get an idea for which fields may be good to filter on first to avoid that excessive query um, filter, and then like which fields may be more likely to get it. So plainly, if we look at, you know, these, see all of these options, my date, my, um, my uh, transaction numbers, you know, my type, like I don't have to open, I don't have to push this arrow. I don't have to open a section to be able to get to any of these. So any of those fields that you don't have to use an arrow to open are a good bet to do your initial sort, especially on this, like the activity ledger is every transact is every line from every transaction. So it's a lot of info. So if you can filter down on, you know, one of these first, then if you need to do a sort on anything that it, you have to open an arrow for, so account, look, this is how account starts and I have to open this arrow and I have to open this code arrow to get to the fund. So that's kind of like just a simple way to try and consider which fields to, uh, to sort on, you know, first to avoid this, or, you know, if you run into this, like what to do is what do I not have to open with an arrow? And, uh, <laughs> So here's where I, you know, when I was thinking about this and we talk about things all different ways, right? Like these, when we have these sessions, like it's our chance to kind of um, talk through things a little bit differently. And I was thinking about this concept of, you know, trying to talk through on the activity ledger, something like this, because when we're looking at it, like it's boxes, it's arrows, and so I kind of have a way that I visualize this. I'm going to try and articulate it. I hope it's not too off the rails, <laughs> but I'm going to go for it because even if it helps, you know, I know everyone kind of thinks of things differently and we're going to visualize a situation, a scenario. <laughs> so I know that this isn't for everyone. So bear with me, but okay. So if I'm going to think about this and I'm going to, I'm just setting up kind of a, a scenario of how our grid's going to gather this data. All right. So in this situation, our grid is a hallway. It's a really long hallway. And for every row on my grid, I have a door in my hallway, okay? My system is a person that's standing at the end of that hallway. And um, in order to get the information, it's gonna walk down the hallway. It's gonna go to each door. Each door has a clipboard that's got a set amount of information. So each each clipboard says the date, you know, the the type. And so my software is going to walk down the hallway. It's going to look at the first door and say, "Okay, let's do this. Let's put in invoice." So my software is going to walk down and it's it's going to make a list. It's going to say, "Okay, door one, that is an invoice. We'll put it on the list. Door two, that's a PO. I'm going to leave it off." Um, our software can walk really fast down the hallway but it's gonna to go to every single door and figure out if the information on, on that door is on the clipboard matches and it'll bring you back the list that it made from going on their little walk. <laughs> all right, so now we've gathered all of the invoices. Now, um, if I go add something from one of these, so uh, say I go in and I'm going to add the account code, so let's bring our account code over here. The account code is one arrow in, right? So now our software starting again at the end of the hallway, when it gets to the first door, it looks at the clipboard information and it says, well, I don't see the account code on that clipboard information. So I can go in the room and then I have the, and then I have a piece of paper that's got my account code in that room. So I can grab the account code, I can see if it matches, see if it goes on my list or not. I go back to the hallway, I go to the next door and I go in that room and so on. And so now we're not just walking down the hallway, we're going in every room. Again, our, our software wa walks really fast, <laughs> but it's got that extra step. It's got that extra effort, right? So next example, we want it to actually look at the fund. So it goes in the door, 
it's got the piece of paper, but the piece of paper has the account called all together, so it can't use that. It's got to go in the it's got to go in the file cabinet that has the codes broken down, and it's got to say, okay, this fund matches. Now I've got that, so I'm going to go back out to the hallway. I'm going to go to the next room, and then I've got to take those steps again. And so, um, if you think about something like that, walking straight down the hallway is the easiest thing to do. But having to go in and out of every room and every file cabinet is a little bit more effort. Um, and if you think about that on a really large scale, every single room on that entire hallway can be an extremely large effort. What we're doing by filtering down on one of the main fields first here, so we come up here, you know, we have these main, these main fields, these are the main doors on our hallway. When we knock this date down to just this year, we're cutting off our hallway. Our hallway is now a lot shorter. So when I go over here and say, okay, now I want to filter on the fund that's a couple of levels in, that's that extra effort, I don't have nearly as many doors to do that for. So that keeps it, um, that makes it easier for the system to be able to do. So again, I hope that's not too off the rails, <laughs> but I wanted to try and give, you know, a visual just to, just to show, you know, the effort that is happening, um, you know, when you're doing some of these fields that are, um, you know, through the arrows essentially that are in, that are a couple layers in. So that's kind of um, how to differentiate and, and why it works like that. And if you think about, I mean, really the simple way to think about it is do did I, does this field, is this field under an arrow, right? Like you don't have to go thinking about hallways all the time, but, um, but yeah, so, so that's a way to help out on this. Um, and again, like, you know, the excessive query, like it does say, please add additional filters to your query. And really that's the, you know, that's the result there is um, seeing what you can filter down first to um, condense that information and some of these things too like um to keep in mind is that um one question that comes up with this is well my results my results are only this many entries right so what this is like seven entries so um sometimes like it's hard I, I totally understand that it's difficult at the end user level where they're like, well, it it's only finding seven entries, so it's not that big of a search. Um, so basically, even if it's a situation where it's still seven entry, well, this is for the year, so it might be, so it's probably more for all time, right? But um, even if it's a situation where the actual number of entries that they end up getting the system still had to go look at look at all the records that were on, that were on that hallway to determine if uh if they matched right so hang on let me get this i lost some light here so i'm gonna try and get that back so you can see my face um and then you know what let me we're gonna look at this error again in a minute jen says i like that visual it helps good i'm glad you know i was a little bit worried i'm like I, and I know that visualizing too isn't um, isn't for everyone. Our brains all work differently, right? So that's a little bit about how mine works. So I figured we'd give it a try. All right, hang on just a second. Nope, all right. We lost the light, but we're gonna keep moving. Okay. So now that we've kind of talked through the why on this error and um, a little bit more about how to avoid it. Let's also look at the stack trace for this. Boom. So my two little arrows, I open this up and I could copy and paste all this. But again, look at this one is interesting because um, especially if you kind of, you know, if it's the question of like, well, I really, I just have like a hundred, this should just pull up a hundred things. So I'm just searching a hundred things. Um, if we come and look here, query results, this is how many connections it's trying to make. 
Now, this isn't necessarily the rows on our grid. This could be the rows plus the room plus the um, file cabinet. Like it's going to do all of those. Um, so it's it's adding up, you know, all of these different things from the query that it's having to search. And then the filter limit is 5,000. So this is basically why it's saying that. And, and, you know, again, the way to get around that is use one of those main um, fields to just condense what that number um, would be to search for that higher level of detail. Okay. This tells me, you know, so say if I did have multiple filters on here or something, this error message is gonna tell me exactly what the information was um, that caused the excessive query. Cause if they got a couple different things in there, maybe you're not sure which one of those steps caused the error. And this one, we don't have the extra info halfway down. So, okay. Okay. So let me see. Just a minute. There we go. We got a light back. Okay. So we talked about um we can test this in live if there are no changes okay oh we're doing pretty good all right so um this next one i want to talk about it here it's not necessarily an error but i feel like it relates to everything that we're talking about with kind of like these grids and the filtering and the columns and the more option <laughs> so i'm going to talk about this here too um and we're talking about testing right so i said this one i'm just looking at a grid i could look at this you know in a test or in live um i am in here though with my admin account you know, if you were looking at this, you're probably in there with your ITC account. Um, this isn't always exactly what the user is looking at because they can have their own custom columns on these grids. One situation where we see this be very relevant is on the account grid, okay? And so if I have a user that's telling me um, my account grid, my expenditure grid is taking forever to load, so I come in here, I can look at it in their live, you know, in this scenario. And I'm like, hey, that loaded really quick. Like, I, you know, why are they seeing this issue? So this is just one that we've had come up regularly. So I wanted to mention it. Um, some of you may know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but if you haven't, I, I wanted to put this out there because this is a good thing to check for. So my expenditure grid is fine. What I can do so now we're going to say all right we need to go look in a test instance so switch gears now i'm looking at a test instance and um i can go to that user in my test instance let me reset their password in my test instance and log in as them because then any columns that they've added um i can see as they're seeing uh, there can be other things that are user specific, like if they have a certain account filter or, you know, if it has to do with like a requisition, they have a certain requisition prefix, um, or even maybe like their role, you know, I mean, as admins, like we can see everything. And so sometimes what they're reporting to us may be different than what we can see because they have a more limited access, right? So let's go in, let's be the Amanda account. And I got all these errors, sorry. Okay. And then let's go see what they're talking about here. So we go to accounts and we go to expenditure. Oh yeah, not too bad, but that wasn't the same. So what I'm gonna look at here is let's scroll and we can see what we have added here. Now, what I would be looking for in this situation, just again, this is like a common one that we've seen. So I would just know what to look for. I know that, um, and this is why I wanted to bring it up so that um, you know what to look for. <laughs> but what I would look for is to see if we have multiple of these columns that are calculated, or this is a huge flag to me. 
when I look at this column and I see repeating, this tells me that this field is from a higher level account. So when I look at my account codes, here, let's move this over so we can kind of go look at both. When I look at my account codes, each of these is unique as an expenditure account, you know, so it's got, it's, oh, it's like these all have different objects. But if I were to look at these at like a cash level, the fund and the special cost center for every single one of these accounts is the same. So it would have the same fund balance at the cash account level or like any accounts with the same um, fund, special cost center, first two digits of the function. And so like the appropriation level, if they have these certain things in common that would match the same appropriation account, then any appropriation balances would be the same for accounts that have those things in common. So let's use our more option, a little handy more option. And when I look at this, um, so again, similar idea with the arrows here. So um, let me close some of these up so that we can kind of start on the playing field. And so this one, you know, it's interesting because we do have, you know, we open it up for code, but that's okay. Um, if I come down here, I have amounts directly off of my main hallway, I have amounts or I have the cash account. And so I'm gonna open this one up so that we can look because this is what we're seeing. So I um, opened this door to the cash account. And then I also then from there opened amounts and then the fund balance is coming from there. So that is this column right here. Now for my example, I picked fund balance, which like that header is pretty descriptive. So we could probably have, you know, told from that, but it could be encumbrance. You know, maybe they picked encumbrance on accident and the encumbrance is the cash account total encumbrances. And they, they might not even mean to do that sometimes, but really when I see the repeating, that's like your tip off that it's probably not directly from that expenditure account. So um, basically this is, this is the addition, this is additional work. This will slow down their grid if they have, um, you know, they could have like a field on here um, from this. If they have a couple fields on here. This could be a lot of work because, um, um, so in this scenario, your software is going to walk down the hallway. It's going to go in the room to get the cash account information. And then it's going to have to take a calculator and add up all of the receipts and all of the expenses for the whole cash account. And then it's going to walk out of that room, walk into the next room and do the same exact thing. And so this one, they've got to calculate. So this one is like even more, which again, our system can work fast. It's not that these things like would never, you know, you would never like want to have them in any scenario. Um, really what I would say here is leaving it on the grid is what you want to watch out for. So we have these available because there are situations where they might want to put it on there so they can, I don't want this to reload. Let me try and avoid that. Um, I didn't, but where we might put it on there and then we might save like a report definition from this grid. So we might want it on there. They might want to see it if they have like a little subset already filtered down, you know, they, they want to see it for like a certain um, subset of, of accounts. And so there are some of these things on the more option because, you know, we want them to be there for the scenarios where they may need them, but it's like, um, you know, it's more of like just thinking long-term, like if they're not using it anymore, essentially. So if they add that, if they add something from the cash account, cause they're looking at one specific thing, I'd just recommend they take it off afterwards. So instead of continuing to have it on there, because then every time they load their expenditure grid, it's going to have to reload all of those. So that's what you want to avoid really. Now, if you do find this situation and you have a user that's got, you know, it, their account um, grids are taking a really long time to, to load because they've maybe added a couple of these, um, 
you know, we can go through the more option. We can try and see what they've added. If, if it's not that clear, you can always just try having them do this reset option. The reset option will set back the grid to the default, to whatever they would have like started with um, as like a new user. And then of course they can go re-add, you know, certain things that they may want to add. So again, this one, not a specific error, but something we run into, uh, so that this, especially like um, using a test instance to log in as them can be very, very helpful in this case. Let's go back to admin though. Okay. All righty. Okay, I had fun coming up with this one. Um, <laughs> this one, we got a couple different errors to look at. I'm gonna go to my purchase order. And let's go ahead and just, and I'm gonna invoice this uh, PO and see what we get. So let me make sure I put in the right thing. So let's let's give this an invoice number. All right. Um, oh yeah, we we got our line our line item here. All right, let's do fifty dollars. Looks good. Doesn't look good. <laughs> so um in this case, I flew right through that invoice, right? And uh just put some random things in there and some things I didn't. And so in this case, we have multiple errors that we're seeing. And um, here's where we're gonna revisit seeing null, right? Invoice vendor may not be null, may not be blank, that it can't be nothing, right? Um, invoice posting period, so this one's interesting, may not be null. Unable to create an invoice with 7-1 date because July is closed, oh, okay. And then it has no items. So we're seeing a variety here, right? If I ran into something like this, let's take care of the things that we can clearly see and kind of go from there. And so what I see is my vendor can't be blank. And um, here, my date doesn't work for the posting period. We're gonna come back to this last one. This one here also has to do with the posting period and it says it can't be blank. And um, what I would, uh, keep in mind is that sometimes null, sometimes blank means it just, it doesn't have complete information or it, like it can't connect to, um, you know, what it's looking for. And so let's go back. Let's close that out. Let's make this June. Let's pick a vendor and then let's see what we get. Okay. Well, that took care of all three. And so what was happening there is um, our third error that said, hey, the date can't um, can't be posted because it can't be this posting period is closed. It also was then unable to like link it to a specific posting period. So it kind of had those two errors that were actually caused by the same thing. Um, all right. So then we have, it has no items which is interesting because we definitely have an item sitting there, right? So let's expand this and see what else we can see. Has no items from rule, invoice must have an item. And um, I can kind of scroll through here. I scroll down, I don't have my additional message. Uh, it doesn't give me that much, but um, I have a couple of things, I have this rule. Let's copy that. But really what I'm seeing is that this has to do with the items. Honestly, I think um, the very first step that I would take, so if you get something like this reported to you, this is one where it's huge of asking, you know, what happened directly before? Like, send me a screenshot of, you know, what you entered. Because what I would do with this is I would say, okay, well, we know that this has to do with the items. Let's look at every field of this item and 
determine if there's something wrong with it because sometimes it's you know may not be that it doesn't exist it it can't pick it up properly because there's something wrong with it and so if we go look at this oh there's no item status i forgot to pick that so if i put a partial status then um, it'll come in here and be able to recognize it so this is one where just like the visual of being able to say i know this has to do with the item if I go, you know, look through, tab through those fields, um, obviously we had to make this error on the fly. So that was like a really easy thing to notice. It's um, unfortunately not always that easy to point out what the thing is. Um, but yeah, but being able to kind of go uh, look at a screenshot, um, you know, even take like, you know, even if you have like your own, like a situation like this, even if it's like your own test instance, that's not their data, Sometimes it helps just to go try and enter a transaction and then see, you know, if you put in something that's just like what they've put in, you know, do you get that error? So, okay. So once we have partial status, maybe I have to, re oh, let's see, I might have to restart. I might have to re-enter this one since I've already messed it up. <laughs> So let's go do this. Oh, no, you know what? Oh, gosh. I just realized. I was, you know what? It's not because of the status. It's not, see, troubleshooting in action. It's not because of the status. So this is my test instance where I was trying to find errors to create for you all it was very suspicious that it said no items let's look at this purchase order oh it does have an item hmm i thought maybe i deleted the item on this one all right let's try it again i uh I had a PO earlier where I was actually amending and deleting items off of it. So I thought maybe we got that one. There we go. There we go. So we just had to kind of reset by going back and uh, <laughs> uh, re-invoicing in that case. We get a warning for our balance checking, but we're good. We have our invoice now. So so that's that. Okay. All right. Okay. So the next thing we're going to go from here and we've got a couple of things we can build off of um, this situation that we just saw. Right. So the first thing I want to talk about is an interesting thing we saw in that error message is where it referred to a rule. Okay. This does happen where uh, sometimes it's even right in the error message, it will refer you to a rule. So let's go to, uh, sorry, system rules. Now, again, in this situation, we figured it out. You know, we were able to, to see, you know, exactly by kind of testing through what was happening there. Um, but I want to give you this piece because sometimes that's not the case. Again, sometimes there are unforeseen errors that, you know, we, we, don't necessarily, they aren't as cut and dry, right? So what I would do, I'm pasting in just that rule name where it started with the org.ssdt. I'm pasting that into my name and then I'm gonna put a percent sign after it and put my wild card so that we can get anything that is uh, that is one of the rules that qualify under that. And so um, in this case, uh, the one that includes this, is I believe it's this one right here, um, invoice items rules. Hmm. Yes. Uh, so right here, require require full invoice items to be after partials and for every invoice to have at least one item. So this rule is connected to the reason we were getting that error. 
Now, again, I know these are like a little bit more techy to look through. Um, honestly, this one looking through here, we've already got it resolved. It's not really going to give us too much more um, at this point. But what I would point out here is I have these two columns, which connect to fields on my rule. Is it enabled? So is that turned on in my software? Yes. Is it mandatory? This one? Yes, it's mandatory, which means even if I wanted to, I cannot turn this rule off. So if I get an error and I come in here and I look at a rule and it's in this situation that says it's mandatory, that means I need to figure out to do something different. I need to, you know, do something different with my transaction because no matter what, this rule is going to apply. Now with invoice rules, that makes sense, right? Like the invoice processing needs to be pretty standard. Um, it's not always the case though. So um, let's go, go into posting periods. And um, our other issue was that July wasn't open, right? So let's say we're gonna open July because we wanna start putting transactions into lot in July, sorry. And uh, boom, we get an error. Now this one cannot reopen a closed posting period because we have a rule. Okay, and it says posting period reopen. Okay, so let's copy this. Let's go to our rules. Again, paste that and then put the um, wildcard after it. Okay, and here it is, posting period reopen, right? And what I can see here, enabled, is it turned on? Yes, that's why it came up in our error. Is it mandatory? No, it's not. This is an optional rule that they can choose to have on or not in their instance. Um, this one, I think it was used a lot at the beginning when people first migrated. I know some districts strongly prefer this um, so that they don't accidentally reopen periods but it is not mandatory, which means it can be turned off. So um, whether that is something where they're not, you know, if they have a situation, so say you have a district, they, they come to you, they have a situation, they need to open this period and they can't, um, what the decision is then is, um, you know, if they want to temporarily or permanently disable this rule. It can be a temporary situation. So say they just want to do it this once, come in here. I'm going to edit it. Uncheck that so it's not going to have the rule enabled anymore. So that means this error will not pop up when they try and reopen. And then we always want to click to activate um, when we're changing a rule. So we'll let that activate. This is a good time to say, so I am going to go over an hour today. Um, I don't expect it to be too much. I mean, maybe like we could potentially go like another 20 minutes. So I totally understand if anybody has to go. I know this might be a longer one, but uh, just to give you a heads up, I, I'm going to keep going because I have a couple more things. Um, but we are definitely recording this. So if anybody needs to pop back to the recording, I understand too. <laughs> All right. So now this is no longer enabled. So I'm going to go to our posting periods. Oh, good question. Okay, let's go back real quick. System rules. Um, so Jen asks, you don't need to validate the rule. What does that do? Let's get our rule back up here. Um, so if you're in here editing, we have this validate option. Validate is basically going to look through the rule and make sure that everything in here would like work correctly. Um, this rule is one that um, it's it also has this bundled field, which means it's one that is comes with the software. You can create custom rules though in here, right? So what validate does is if you're adding a rule, like say you came in you know, modify like an existing rule or like wrote a custom rule or we sent you a custom rule. When you're adding a new uh, rule in here basically is when I would use the validate because validate's gonna kind of check it and make sure that everything that's in here, all of this language makes sense. 
But in this case, it's a rule that is already in here and already written. So since we're just disabling it, we don't really need to take that validate step. Good question. Uh, yeah, it doesn't hurt any. If you always validate first, it does not hurt anything whatsoever. It's just running a little double check to make sure everything's valid. Um, can you edit an existing rule to clarify it to users? Can you add a description to then and now? Um, yes, there are. You can. Okay, so what I would do is I wouldn't necessarily edit the existing rule, but you can take the text of a rule and then like put it in a text document. And there are ways to make modifications to it. Um, let's get through this part. We're, we'll hop back to the rules and, and I'll take a look at that then and now rule um, to kind of just look at that one to see if that would be a possibility. So we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, all right, let's go ahead and reopen July now. And uh, boom, we did it. Now that our rule is disabled, I didn't get an error. I did what I needed to do. If the district wanted that to, to be in place regularly, this was just an exception, you absolutely can go right back to that rules grid and then re-enable it, activate, and um, then it would be back in place. So you can also do that where there are exceptions made. Um, when rules are enabled or disabled, uh, that is something um, I believe that shows in the app log. We're going to be in there in a little bit, so we'll check. Uh, so there would be like a record, you know, if that was changed to make it allowed. Okay. All right, one more that I want to mention with the um, with like a rules related error, and then we'll hop over back to that rules grid. Is um, in this case, this was nice because we got, we saw the rule, we saw like the error, I'm sorry, the rule in the error. We saw the rule text in the error, right? That's not always the case. Um, let's go to our payables. And what I'm gonna do for this one is I have a payable sitting out here. It's a credit, uh, it's a negative 50 because they wanted to post a credit. So we're gonna go ahead and post this. But in this case, I get an error that says attempting to create a disbursement with a negative amount for 50. So that is uh, not allowed in my software at this moment. And um, so, that, so that's what my error is indicating to me. Let's see. Okay. So this is where we are going to um, take additional step because so far when we've been looking at these, we had two little errors arrows to expand to see our error detail. Now, in a situation like this, where you don't have your handy two little arrows, or maybe it's um, an error that your district got and told you about, but they didn't click the arrows at the time, and uh, maybe you can't recreate it, you know, something like that. There's another place that you can see that error detail. And for that, we're going to go to system monitor. And we're going to go to the app log tab. Now you can see it's looking pretty wild in here since we've got all these errors we've been prompting. <laughs> but we have our most recent one. And look, I have a little, oops, sorry. A little crazy with the scroll here. But I have a little um, error message over here attempting to create a disbursement, negative amount, 50. Okay, awesome. So I know that's the one. So I can click right on that. <clears throat> All right, and then look, actually right here, I get a different error message that gives me some more information. Attempting to create the dispersion with the negative 50 from rule, prevent disbursements with a negative amount. Boom. Let's grab that. <clears throat> Excuse me, just a minute. Okay, so let's grab that and we'll go back to our rules grid.
Okay. So let's look at the error. Disbursement with the negative amount. Boom, there it is right there. And I probably should stop clicking that because I don't need to open that side necessarily. And so what are we looking for? We're seeing true, it's turned on. Mandatory, false, it is not mandatory. So this is one, it, it is enabled in the system by default too. So um, like the last one we looked at, that would have had to have been turned on. But this one is one that um, basically like any, if they've never touched this, if they've never done anything, like if you've never done anything to customize this for a district, then it's going to be on by default. Um, but it can be turned off. So again, the same steps would apply. You would edit this, you check it, um, uncheck enabled to turn it off and then um, save that up, activate that rule. And we're like activating the change rather, I should say, because obviously the rule we're disabling, but we're activating through the change of that. Oops, it's still going. If you uh, if you don't activate it, um, so say you make a change to a rule and then you don't do activate, the rules are like um, kind of set like with a restart. So like if you have something out there that um, was changed and then activate wasn't clicked like the next time it restarts then it'll be like activated but um but that kind of just lets you prompt the actual change on the fly so okay let's go back let's post this real quick so we'll do that we'll post it and boom so now we were allowed to post that negative disbursement. And again, I could go back to the rules and re-enable it if I wanted to, if I, this was like a one-time exception, um, you know, or if they wanted to leave it that way, um, that is completely between, you know, you, your districts, like however you want to handle that. Okay, let's go back. I'm, I'm going to go back to this um, rules grid and let's sidetrack a little bit and talk about this. So the then and now rule. I um, don't know off the top of my head um, if this is specifically a rule. Um, let's see. So that happens. That happens when you're invoicing, right? Hmm. Invoice. Let's just take a look real quick and see if we can find any that look like they fit. Oh, maybe it's this one. Invoice date is prior to purchase order date. I think it's that one. Second one down. Okay. Okay. I'm just going to do edit so we can like see here. So, all okay, right. So here's what I would do um, is I wouldn't um, necessarily edit the SSDT rule. And, and I think if we tried to save it with this name, it might give us an error. What I would do is come in here. I'm just going to copy everything that's in this text. Okay. Oh, we are going off the rails, but this is fun. All right. So, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to paste it into a, a, a TXT document. So I'm using notepad plus plus. I have like some characters enabled here. So I know it looks kind of weird, but uh, you could do this in regular notepad um, as well. And I think we actually might have a recording that drills down more about like modifying rules, but look at this one real quick. So let's see. So all of this part at the top is just kind of like mapping out just some standard things about this rule, the description, and what we want to look for. So you're saying add the description to then and now. So like, okay, so when we're looking at, this one has multiple different like layers to it in the rule. This one is like rule, invoice date prior to PO date. Here's, so this is the text for this part of the rule. So it's saying like when, and then it kind of maps out this techie stuff of basically telling me when 
the purchase order date is, and then see this greater than symbol. So if the purchase order date is greater than the invoice date, this is when this rule kicks in, okay? And then it says then, see the then down here? I wonder if I can zoom in on this. Zoom in on this. Okay, I can't zoom in on this, sorry. So if, if that occurs, then the warning is gonna be, quote, the invoice date is prior to the PO date. This will cause the PO to be marked as, quote, then and now. And so if we wanted to change this uh, like warning message, we could. Um, let's take out, I'm not really sure what these other, we could look through these other ones, but for simplicity, I'm just gonna take out the rest of these. We're not gonna worry about those right now um, for our example. I'm not even gonna look at them. But if I wanted to change this, um, not sure like what specifically you would want it to say, but let's just type in. We're rolling with it. I think we have to change. I'd have to go back and look at my notes for our prior training. We might have to change something up here, but you know what? We're gonna we're just gonna try it. So let me copy this. Let's go back in. Um, again, I'm not gonna edit this current rule. I'm gonna create one. Let's put this in. Um, I let, I'm going to open this again because I'm just going to take some of these. I think we might have to change. Let's, you know what? Oh, and then this is where we want to use validate. Mm, okay. So it let us validate. So it seems to be okay with what we've put in there. Uh, we're kind of, we're rolling on the fly here. So let's save. Oh, yeah, I enabled it. Let's save that. Okay. So now. And then let's edit our original rule. I'm going to turn this one off because I want to get my, I don't want to have the two conflicting rules. Oh, add that in now to the description field. Okay. Oh boy. Let's go back over here. So yeah, this is description field. So you're thinking this description, okay, maybe, maybe I'm going way off the rails here. So you really just wanted to change the description in the rules grid? Um, or did you want it to change like what the, so what, what we're doing right now, it's going to change it for what the user sees and for what we see in the rules grid. If you just want to change it in the rules grid, actually, I don't know that we have to make a custom rule. So sorry if I misunderstood that there. But we got to go test it. <laughs> oh, so you can find it easier. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We got a bonus then. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we let's go. Okay, before we go try a roll, let's let's do one more thing. Let me double check. I don't know. I don't remember off the top of my head if we can change this. So let's see, where was Let's go try and edit this one. Oh yeah, see we can't we can't edit this description. So yeah, we'd have to create like our own to be able to to change the description. Okay. 
Okay, we're going to be back on track in a minute here, but we got to go try this. So let's see. So let's try and invoice this one. So 620. Ooh. Mm, oh, yeah, no, this is the one that I was messing with. Okay, let's try this one. So 515. So we want to go before 515. I don't know if May is open. Darn it. Okay. I'm getting extra far into the bonus now. I promise I'll get back, back on track in a minute. <laughs> But again, uh, you know, this is where uh, we prefaced at the beginning that, you know, this is a little bit different than a regular training where we're kind of just like we're troubleshooting, right? Like, and this is part of it too. Like, this is what I do if I'm like working on something like this. We're trying to, you know, um, do a custom rule. Like someone's kind of asked you for something like this. Like you might go in and going through and testing this is definitely part of the process. So we're seeing it live. Oops. Five, ten. Partial. Did I not? I didn't activate my rules. Darn it. I didn't activate, did I? Okay. Well, I think we've looked at, I think we've looked at enough for y'all to get the gist of it. So I'm not going to. I'm not going to focus in too much on that, even though part of me would love to, but, uh, but let's move on. Let's move on. Good question. Thank you, Rhonda. Um, that was a good little sidetrack. Okay. So, uh, let's see, uh, let's go back. Yes. Yes. You would disable the initial rule and enable the new rule. The part that I would watch out for now in this case, like, and if you, if this is something you genuinely want to do, put in a ticket and, and, um, we can help you out with this. Because for example's sake, um, in our training session, I just deleted the rest of the stuff out of that rule. I don't know that you would want to do that. We might want to look through um, you know, those additional things that we just scrapped out of there for the sake of keeping our example simple. So uh, so we'd probably want to look at that and not just um get rid of those other things. So uh, but yes, the the simple uh part would be, you know, especially if you're keeping the rule the same would be disable the old one, enable the new one. All right. Okay. So uh, where I'm going, um, let's go back to, um, I'm going to go system monitor. Let's look at what we were looking at with the app log again. So we got our little taste of this when we found the disbursement error, right? Um, now, Let's just, I know we've been in here on some trainings before, but this is just such a good tool for looking up errors, for troubleshooting. Like this is somewhere that I use very often when looking into things. So we have, um, first of all, our timestamps, right? So if you have a situation where, um, you know, you have a district, you have a user that's reported an error to you you can't recreate it. Like, you know, they're not really sure on the details or, or whatever. Um, this is another option is to say, well, what time, like, do you know about what time that happened? And, um, and like the date, right? And so you can come in here and look around that timestamp to see if you can find an error that occurred. Because if we look through here, we can see um, these different errors. And so I'm going to click on one and I get this, if I click right on the row, I get this pop up to the side. And so this is pretty plain, but if I scroll down, I have the error detail. Again, this is like, if you need to send it into us and we're asking for a stack trace or an error detail, this is another place to get it. And what we're looking for is everything in this box down here copied and pasted into a Word document. Um, but let's look real quick at this one. So this one, posting period may not be null. 
oh look this was the error that we got because we tried to post in may before it was open uh let's click on this next error down here oh here's my negative fifty dollars from disbursement and so every error that i was getting in this training is also logged in this application log look at here's my invoice has no items we went and looked at that one excessive query cost everything um the other trick that you can use on here is look at you can see my my commonly filtered <laughs> but um error i can go put in error and just see the errors because there are um errors there are warnings or there's just like informational things so if you are you know looking for something specific this can help to narrow it down uh the informational things can also help though so look at this this first one here rule events disable event fired so a rule was disabled and that was an auditable event. So we could probably go look that up, get more info um, some other way, but this is telling us that the rules were changed. And then reload, I believe that's activate. So the rules were activated. And so this app log can give you a lot of context to what's happening when troubleshooting, because like, um, look, I can see the posting period was reopened. So I can see there's an error and then I can see the posting period was reopened. And so like, so sometimes it's just a matter of like, even if it's not telling you, you know, exactly ABC what happened, if I know that I got this error, but it was like after this period was closed, then that might help explain like why I got this error at that point in time, right? So this is a very helpful tool. Again, I know that um, some of this can be a little bit overwhelming when you're looking at it, right? Because it's like you look at logger name and it's like, what does that mean? Um, but hopefully filtering it down or focusing on a specific timestamp um, again. And then when you get over here, usually it's the first line. Like usually it's like the first line or halfway down. So um, if you have a situation where you're looking for these, that's where I would focus. And I would uh, focus on looking for like keywords of things that you can connect to or look at, you know, and, and then connect that to the process or the information that the user was entering. And if all else fails, this is what you want to copy and send to us <laughs> and we'll help you out with it. Okay. All right. I have one last thing that I want to talk about. and um you know through our training today we've talked a lot about uh you know some things you can log into their live and look at um and i keep mentioning like if you go into a test instance and look at things um so what i want to talk about is if you spin up a test instance like whether that's through management council or um if your tech tech team spins up like a test instance um for troubleshooting there are a couple things to keep in mind and the main thing I want to talk about is the job scheduler. So if I go to job scheduler here. So when you create a test instance, um, it's basically smart enough to know like this is not, this is like a duplicate of their live, right? Now in their live, they could have report bundles set to go to people. They could have reports that would set to send. And so when you're spinning up a duplicate, when you're spinning, spinning up a test instance, um, basically it is configured so that it will not automatically be sending anything from your test instance. Now that's a good thing, right? Like you don't want it to be, you don't want to close a period and test and have it be emailing your, their district users, right? So it's set up to safeguard against that. But what that means is that some of these things are not the same in test as they would be in live. Um, one of the main things is the job scheduler. So if you have a district that has some kind of problem that you're looking at with the job scheduler, say it's like the report bundles getting sent or um, an account change, um, both of those things use this job scheduler. And 
if we spin up a backup at SSDT, or if you spin up a test instance, and you look at the job schedule, it's not going to be the same as their live. Um, that's why, like, uh, you know, and you may have encountered it. If if we have a ticket with you on this, sometimes we'll ask you to come in here and take a screenshot of, you know, what's going on in their job scheduler, because like, we just cannot recreate that in the same way. Now, um, if you're in here, I don't have any like, sorry, sorry, they don't have any like, you know, test jobs, but uh, we have the status and sometimes it'll say failed. So if you look in live and they have one of these that's failed, click directly on it. Same thing like we were talking about in the app log and it, it'll have a job result. So sometimes there's an error message here that will work similar where, you know, you might be able to get some information out of the first line of it, or you could copy and send that to us. So, uh, but again, like in your backup, it'll probably show a lot of times, like if there's something set to send, it'll show rejected. Rejected means it's not turned on because it's not their live. Now, um, if you need to test something and like what we do, because obviously like there are things that we wanna be able to show you, there are things that we may need to test um, there is a way to turn this on and maybe you're just turning on the jobs, you know, right? Uh, so where this is configured is uh, system configuration. And this is going to be in the application configuration. So I have this set up here, instance type. So if you log into a live instance, it's going to say production. Production is by default going to have all of this, like, you know, going to have emails can send if you have that configured. Um, the jobs can run, like everything's set to go. But, you know, training, demo, mindset under support, like by default, those things aren't necessarily turned on. You don't really have to change the instance type. Like if you're, you have a test instance and, and that doesn't say production, don't change it. You don't have to change it to production. I would just leave that as is. The important two that we want to note, and you know, this isn't like this isn't a copy of actual district. This is our example data. So mine are turned on. External notification enabled. This means, um, in basic terms, uh, to me, it means can it send emails? So if I have something in the email configuration that gives it a server to send through, like, is my instance allowed to send emails out? And it is. Um, if you have a, a test instance, this would be unchecked by default. Uh, if you're going to test something like say you're setting up a bundle and you want to test email it to yourself, then you want to check that. The second one is job execution enabled. So can the job scheduler run jobs basically? And if this is unchecked, then any jobs that go there will just automatically be rejected. Like it's not even gonna try and run them. So um, by default, like an account change, uh, you know, again, report bundles, like it's just not going to um, by default be able to run those, but you can check this, let jobs run. So like I could test uh, sending a report bundle to my file archive with just the jobs, you know, the job set up, but, no external notification, it's just going in the system. That So I use this configuration quite a bit just to be safe. Like I'll turn on the jobs, but I won't turn on the external. Um, but yeah, so that's, so that's what each of those means. And if you, you know, obviously situations come up where you do need to test those things. And uh, so this is where you're going. Okay. I cancel out of this, just leave that alone. All right, well, um, thank you for staying with me for our extra time today. Uh, that is um, all I have as far as what we're looking at. If you have any other questions, let me know um, in the chat, but thank you all so much. I hope that this was helpful. And um, again, you know, if you run into an error that you're not sure of, like definitely send us a ticket. We can definitely help you out with these things as well. But um, I know sometimes if you can kind of just nail down what it is, that's a quicker turnaround for you, right? <laughs> so, um, all right. Well, thank you so much. I hope everyone has a great weekend. Um, I'll hang out if you have questions, but uh, I think we're set to go. So have a good one.
Hey, Amanda, can you take a question real quick? Absolutely. Okay. Um, there have been a couple situations over the last week where I've needed to um, test some things uh, with workflows, either in USAS with the requisition workflow or in USPS with the employee onboarding. Um, what's the best way to set up a test instance um, with Management Council? I, I can't get the workflows to connect properly. I, I think it's some sort of configuration I might be missing. Um, it just doesn't seem to be able to read the workflows uh, on my test instances. Interesting. Um, so, well, I am not sure if our, like, I'm not sure exactly what your options look like with the management council, but are you doing, let me, but let me ask this to try and figure that out is, uh, do you set up, like, are you taking kind of basing it off of a copy of an existing district? Yes. Um, but the district that you're using doesn't currently have workflows. No, they do. They do. Okay. <laughs> well, okay. So when I go in there and I take a backup, um there's usually an option where it'll give me like if i want to copy usas usps inventory and then workflows is an option on there it should be right. and yeah, so i choose like if, if i'm using like um requisition workflows mm -hmm. uh, i'll choose usas and workflows okay yeah so that is what i would do is i would i would do both and then um once you are in um then you have like your configuration uh and the module would need to be turned on if they're using it in live though that should be the case it is um it is. if you look at i think the uh, api um screen everything's blank and I, I just can't get anything to pull in there hmm well I'm not sure off the top of my head. Um, I believe it's possible from what I recall, I believe I've pulled them before, like pulled backups and had them kind of like still be able to connect. So I think that there is a way to do it. We might have to look into it specifically. So if you put in a ticket to us and then um, we'll see maybe what, you know, if we can check it out and try and pull one, see if it's something that is happening in the configuration that we can change, or, you know, it might be something that we need to check with MC about, but I do think it's possible. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay. All right, well, I'll wrap it up then. Thanks again, everyone, for attending and have a great weekend.